title of my sermon is Upside Down Thinking. We don't want to have upside down thinking, do we? And so I'm going to start out with a quiz. And uh, I'm going to ask you these questions. Actually, you don't need to raise your hand for fear of uh, humiliating yourself in front of everyone, right? (laughs) Okay, number one. Jesus was born in a barn because, number one, or A, the innkeeper's fault, Jews, uh, secondly, the Jews' fault, thirdly, humanity's fault, or something else. Jesus was born in a barn because the innkeeper, the Jews, humanity in general, or something else. Question number two. Angels sing, sang only to a few shepherds because they were the only ones seeking for the Messiah. God prefers shepherds because David was a shepherd. Jesus would be known as the good shepherd or something else. Number three, Jesus spent his first years in Egypt because Herod was seeking to kill him God wanted him to be bilingual. God wanted him to be acquainted with firsthand with those others would call heathen or all of the above or none of the above or other. (laughs) So you see our choices. We assume a lot, don't we? When we read the story, and of course it's been read many, many times through the years. But the question is, were God's plans foiled and altered by humanity, or did God plan things that way? Let's look at Isaiah 55, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8. By the way, those of you that came to the seminar and uh, purchased binders, we have, and as I mentioned the last night of the seminar, because it was an incomplete seminar, that is not 12 sessions. I recorded three sessions from a previous seminar and so those of you that ordered the CD set have those. Also, we have all of those lessons with their exhibits for those that bought binders or bought, yes, the lessons, the workbooks, and uh, also, of course, the CDs. Even if you didn't buy a CD, but you bought the notebook, pick up a lesson at the table. Isaiah 55 and verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So first of all, we notice that God does things differently than we do, right? He thinks different. His thoughts are different than us. So when we look at the birth of Jesus in a barn and dirty shepherds and wise men instead of uh, the Israelites learning the news and so on, we assume that somehow God had a different plan but it never worked out. But I propose to you today that it was all planned ahead of time. Let's see what the primary purpose of Jesus coming to earth was. John the 14th chapter. John chapter 14, and yes, this does relate to the seminar because it's the bottom line of Christianity. John 14 and verses 8 through 9, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen what? The Father, I should say. Who? How do you say? Show us the Father. So Jesus' primary purpose in coming to this earth was to give an accurate picture of his Father in heaven. And of course, he with the Father. Uh, Let's turn also a couple chapters ahead, three chapters ahead to John the 17th chapter. In the Lord's Prayer, notice what Jesus says in verse 4 of John 17. He said, I glorified thee on earth. And by the way, glorify means to reveal. 
when the Bible says in Matthew the fifth chapter that we are to um, we are to obey God so that others will see our good works and glorify the Father, that means that our job is to reveal what God is like. And a lot of us don't do a very good job of that, do we? But that is our goal, and that is to live a life so that people say, ah, I get it. That's what Jesus is like. That's what God is like. God, Jesus said, I glorified thee on earth, having accomplished the work which thou hast given me to do. Notice, before Jesus even died on the cross, he said, I accomplished what you sent me to do. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? We always think, why did Jesus come to this earth? Well, to die for our sins. That's very true, but the primary purpose was to reveal what God is like. And he did that through everything he did, including being born in a barn, <laughs> and so on and so forth, and I'll expand on this in a minute. You see, the Jews had different expectations about God and what he was like, different expectations about the Messiah's coming, and of course that's why they didn't recognize him. Uh, the Bible says he came to his own, and that was the Jewish people. He had prepared them for a couple thousand years for this event. He came to his own, and his own knew him not. One of the saddest verses in the Bible. Back when I was a young pastor in the uh, Wisconsin Conference, we lived up way up north. They called the pastor of that area the King of the North because it was right under Lake Superior. In fact, the churches I had, one was Superior Church across from Duluth. And we bought 12 acres out in the woods and we built a cabin with our own hands and without going into debt, which meant that we did it. Each time we got paid, we bought a little more. We moved into it with screens over the windows instead of glass. Tar paper on the roof, a homemade door and a British 303 hanging above it. <laughs> um, so there we were. What was I getting to? Oh, yes. So there was a new conference ministerial director, associate ministerial director that the conference chose. And he was going to come up and speak in my church that weekend and spend the night with us in our home, he and his wife. And so we imagine, you know, someone from the conference office is coming to see us. This is great. I didn't know who he was. And so Debbie had the table all fixed up with nice linen tablecloth and their best china out. And I had my necktie on and everything. And uh, she had a beautiful dress on and we were waiting. And finally here comes their car. And they jump out, they had blue jeans, sweats and a couple sleeping bags. <laughs> And we did not expect them to be like that. We became the best of friends even to this day, and that was many years ago. But we had different expectations than what actually happened. That's easy to understand, but the Jews had different expectations of what the Messiah would be like when he came. So when he came, they totally missed out on it. He came to reveal what God is like. The problem is, Today, we look back at the Christmas story and we think it should have been different too. Does that mean we have different ideas about God, just like the Jews? You see, religions evolve. Did you know that? Through the years, religions evolve. They start right. And then as time goes on, human beings involved with them add things to them, add rules and add all kinds of expectations. And with those rules and expectations come all kinds of false views of God. This has never not happened to a double negative. It's always happened through history. We know of the Dark Ages. We spoke about that in the seminar. The Christian church started out by Jesus and the disciples. But about three centuries later, they were bogged down in all kinds of discussions about things and they were, there were factions within the church. In fact, way before that, Gnosticism came in. Do you know that um, by the fourth century, the beginning of the fourth century, the big issue 
was whether Jesus was eternal God or became God once he was human and went back to heaven. That was the big issue. And you couldn't be wrong in those days. That is, you couldn't have a differing opinion. There was no religious liberty. And the two sides of the controversy in Greek is called homoousian and homoousian. The only difference is that an iota or an I is added to a long word. And over this, there was bloodshed. In the 10 years of Diocletian persecution, the Christians uh, were not fighting because they were persecuted. Many were in prison. And uh, persecution tends to purify the church. And we lay aside all these trivial things. We become wholly dedicated. By 313, the persecution ended, and by 315, the arguments over homoousian and homoousian began again <laughs> in earnest. And, uh, and then the emperor, of course, Constantine became a Christian. Then some emperors were homoousian and some were homoousian, and they persecuted the others, persecuted each other. Remember I told you about Julian and how he wanted to take Rome back to the pagan years, the good years, the virtuous years, because the folklore and so on. And uh, he would often bring in two Christians, a homoousian and a homoousian, and have them debate it before his throne for amusement. <laughs> By the way, I said he was the first hippie. He grew his hair real long. He became a vegetarian. He sold all the furniture in the palace and slept on the floor. Uh, Dennis, how, how does that fit into this? Oh yes, upside down thinking. So um, there is an evolutionary process within religion, something that we have to continually remember and correct ourselves. Am I following the Bible's pure religion or am I sliding into some man-made problems that go along with it? Thomas Jefferson said, if the, if the Gospels had been followed, the pure teachings of Jesus, the whole world would be Christian. There is something contagious about pure Christianity. And he said that he didn't attend church merely because the churches had, were teaching fables. And he wanted to hear the good news, the Gospel, as Jesus taught it. So when you think about the story of the birth of Jesus, in Matthew, the third chapter, we look at the first element, and that is John, the one who is coming to announce Jesus' birth. Um, Matthew, chapter 3. You see, if you were going to do something big, the most significant thing in history, and you sent out a PR person to prepare people, what kind of a person would you send out? Wouldn't they be fluid in speech, attractive? dignified, have an entourage, a limousine, and all that. Here's John the Baptist sent to prepare the people for the coming of Christ. Matthew 3, verses 1 through 7 says, Now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Why didn't he preach in Jerusalem where the people were? He preached in the wilderness and people came out to hear him. He said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt on his waist and his food was locust and wild honey. Um, then Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan. They were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said, you, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth the fruit in keeping with your repentance. He must not have read the book by Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. This was the forerunner of Jesus. You'd think Jesus would spend the first year in his ministry apologizing for John, but he didn't. Why? Because everything was planned to show what God is like. And it, it did not fit any human expectations. 
think of Mary, Luke the first chapter. Mary the mother of Jesus, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 30 says this. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. That means the sixth month of Elizabeth, her cousin's um, pregnancy. To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. What would you think if an angel came and said that to you? It'd be awesome. But she was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. You know, they say the closer we get to God, the more sinful we appear in our own eyes. See, if a person thinks, wow, I've got it all put together, that's the first sign that they have problems. And uh, the angel said, favored of God, and it troubled her. How could I be favored of God? The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and shall name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Can you imagine Mary? Here she is. She isn't married yet and she's going to be pregnant. That's a problem. There's more of a problem in those days than today. A real problem then, because the baby that was born back in those days that appeared to be illegitimate or out of wedlock was considered a bastard. Jesus was considered by many to be a bastard. And, uh, and you could not mingle or go to the temple or mingle with other Jews for 10 generations after that kind of a birth. Think of that, human rules. God was breaking all human tradition. What about Joseph, Matthew, the first chapter? Matthew chapter 1 tells us of Joseph. Verses 18 through 21. It says, now the birth of Jesus was as followed when his mother Mary had betrothed to Joseph. That means she was promised to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's fine for Joseph and Mary to know, but what do others think? What do others think? Jesus, that's a Greek transliteration of a very common name, Joshua. Now, if you were sending the most important person to this earth, the one who created it, what would you name him? Joshua was one of the most common names in that century. People say, well, Joshua was just born. Oh, who's he? Oh, he's going to be the Messiah. Really? There's three Joshuas on this block. And Isaiah says that there was nothing attractive about Jesus. Isaiah 53. And we're looking at verses 2 and 3. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him. In other words, there was nothing attractive physically to Jesus. He was despised and forsaken, a man of sorrows and so on, acquainted with grief. The Bible says that he was not good looking. He didn't have a stately form. I don't know if that meant that he was stooped like me, or short, or what. There was nothing that people say, wow, a natural leader, nothing. Shepherds were the ones the angels sang to. I want to read what one author said about this. This is the book, The Jesus Style by Gail Irwin. 
And he says this concerning the shepherds. Um, what if you had been one of the members of the angelic choir chosen to announce the birth? For 200 years you've been practicing and anticipating the glorious presentation. Everything is in perfect tune and timing for the concert of the ages. For 100 years they've been building a stage in the sky for the great moment. Then Gabriel says, he's born. You're on, fellows. The curtains are pulled back and you see the crowd. Six shepherds. What a letdown. Okay, someone asked, who was in charge of the posters? Shepherds weren't exactly the centers of communication. Their captive audience could only, uh, they could only talk to other sheep. Also, shepherds were not the best messengers to be carrying such important news. In the time of Jesus, they had lost the respectful reputation they might have had in the time of David. Do you remember when Israel was journeyed down to Egypt? It said they were all shepherds. And the Egyptians were turned off by normal farmers, by shepherds. And so they lived in the land of Goshen, separate from the sophisticated Egyptians. Now here, many years later, almost 2,000 years later, when Jesus comes, shepherds are looked down on because the Jews have become respectable, see. So what does Jesus choose? He chooses shepherds. They tended to be little light-fingered with other people's property, shepherds. That was their reputation. Nor were they particularly welcome in town. People didn't put much stock in... Um, in their word either. Can you hear the conversation in a home in Bethlehem? The shepherds have visited the manger and then leave town knocking on doors as they go, all the way yelling, Joshua is born, Joshua is born. Oh boy, another Joshua in this neighborhood, that's all we need. Who said that anyway? Oh, just your friendly local burglar. What did you say? The shepherds, God chose shepherds. Then he chose wise men. It's interesting that uh, he bypassed the seminary in Jerusalem. He bypassed all the preachers and the priests and the prophets of the day and went all the way to uh, an area in southern Babylonia. His Bible says that the Magi, I think it's Magi, we call them Magi, but J is not a sound in that language, the Magi were in southern Babylon, and the reason they knew something about a star that would come in the east out of Jacob was because they had the writings left by Daniel. Daniel was in charge of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans came from southern Babylon. There was an entire tribe known as the Magi. They were the smart ones. And so they traveled to Jerusalem. They said, where is he, born king of the Jews? And they said, well, we're not sure. Go ask Herod. So they went and asked Herod. And the Bible says the entire city of Jerusalem was disturbed by these wise men coming and asking questions. Why? Because God had bypassed his chosen remnant people and gone to what they called the heathen and gave them light on the birth of the Messiah. And we are told that this began the rejection of Jesus by the priests. In other words, they couldn't handle it. If this is truly the Messiah, he would come to us. Why would he go to the heathen? God does things differently, doesn't he? Well, Jesus was born in a barn, surrounded by the animals he had created. What a perfect setting. He had made them. He was born in a barn. Now, a barn's not the most sanitary place. They took the hay or the grain out of a feeding trough and put Jesus in there. Some of the saliva was on the sides of it from the animals having eaten there. Our kids were born in hospitals. They didn't have hospitals in those days. I would imagine people were born at home with a midwife. And so there, Jesus was born in the barn. When our son Andy was born, I was so excited. I was in the delivery room. Debbie was the one giving birth, of course. And, uh, and we didn't know if it was a boy or girl in those days. Uh, I guess today there's 57 choices, but the, back then there were only two. And believe me, there still are only two. 
Anyway, they said, he's a boy, and they handed him to me, put a little blanket around him. They hadn't even cleaned him up. I was so excited, I ran out the door and down the hall to show Amy. She was nine. And by the time the nurse caught up with me, Amy was holding the new baby brother. And the nurse grabs the baby and said, you can't be out here. Why not? Well, there's germs out here. She ran back, or she walked back. I had violated some rule, I guess. Jesus was born in a barn. I mean, it was just the hall of the hospital. It was better than a barn. But I didn't know all the rules. Back when our daughter, um, our firstborn, was just a little girl, we lived at Andrews University in Michigan, and we used to go on Sabbath afternoons off and down to the barn, the farm to see the cows, and uh, I always wanted to be a farmer. In those days, I thought I was going to be a farmer. And so we'd go down, and the, we'd go in the calf barn. It was so interesting. And the little calves are so eager to be touched, and of course, they're always hungry, you know. So I'd say to Amy, I'd say, put your hand out like this in the calf's mouth. It really feels weird. You know, their, their tongue is like sandpaper, and they only have teeth on the bottom, I think. And they suck real hard, you know, and, and that was so exciting. And then you pull it out, and there's this long string <laughs> that puts out rainbow colors. I'm just trying to be real about where Jesus was born. We see nativity scenes, and they don't smell. Have you ever noticed that? But Jesus was born in a barn, in a cave that they used for a barn. <clears throat> and then he went about his life. The Bible tells us that his mother trained him. That means he was homeschooled. In those days, when you were six, you went to school. I've told you this before. You memorized the first five books of the Bible. By the time you're 10, if you had that memorized, you go on to more advanced things. Jesus didn't do any of that. His mother taught him. And, uh, and I, would, I would imagine she taught him very thoroughly from the Old Testament, because he knew the Bible, didn't he? Well, Jesus went on to become a carpenter. And according to Jewish tradition, when you went to school, if you passed, if you memorized the first five books, and then you went on to the next level, which was 10 to 14, if you memorized the rest of the Old Testament, that's right, memorized it, then you, then you submitted to a teacher, a great teacher, like Gamaliel was one of many. Paul was the student of Gamaliel, so Paul succeeded. If you dropped out because you couldn't memorize, you became an apprentice to your father and did whatever trade he did. Joseph was a carpenter. Guess what Jesus became? A carpenter. And Jesus dignified manual labor. See, in our society, manual labor, I guess they need a lot more technicians now, people to fix the cars and the refrigerators and the electronics and all these things. Why? Because everyone wants to do something else. I was listening to a talk show host this week that said young people were being interviewed to find out what they wanted to be, what kind of a career, and some of them said they wanted a career in scanning YouTube. What a career. And I mean, what big goals. <laughs> so that you know they can keep track and report and someone will pay him for doing that i can't imagine it jesus dignified humble work now they didn't have home depot in jerusalem so i would imagine jesus and his father went out and cut down trees and then they cut them and whatever they had to do to make boards out of them and let them dry so they could build furniture I would imagine when Jesus preached and you shook his hand on the way out of the synagogue, he had a strong hand with calluses. Jesus. Why was he here? To show what the Father was like. To challenge us to be humble, to work quietly, to, to do the right thing, to have integrity. He had no degree, he had no office, no official authority, no money. He wasn't handsome. He had questionable friends. Matthew 11 and verse 19. <clears throat> Matthew 11 and verse 19 says, The Son of Man came 
eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a gluttonous man, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. You want to see what God is like? He hung out with sinners. He wanted to draw them to himself. He wanted them to live a different life. What about the disciples? Again, in the book Jesus Style, page 19, it says this. I like the way this author writes. He entitles it The Motley Crew. When we get a new president of the United States, everyone watches closely to see who he surrounds himself with, what kind of staff and cabinet he chooses. The Son of God comes to earth. It begins to reveal what kind of reign he will have by putting together his traveling band of people. Now, I would have told him to go to the best-known seminary and pick at least three professors who have good grasp on theology and all its ramifications. Then you should go to Hollywood and get people with charisma who can command the attention of crowds and explain to them what it meant when he said something. Then go to Wall Street and pick a few millionaires. It's always good to have a few of them on the team. Then, by all means, go to Muscle Beach and pick six bodyguards. Otherwise, those religious leaders might put him to death. But Jesus didn't check with me. Instead, he went to the streets and the wharves and picked out the strangest crew ever to be sent out on a mission to change the world. Had you been walking within 50 feet of them, you probably would have detected the odor of fish. He had a zella and a tax collector on the team. This is a combination not unlike black revolutionary and Ku Klux Klan member. Some of them had heavily identifiable accents inappropriate to the need for eloquence on the team. Jesus was found constantly among the sordid, from the violent to the crafty to the sensual. I would have fired Peter within a week or two of his hiring. His life indicates that he suffered from foot and mouth disease. His impulsiveness decreased his usefulness from 50% at the most. Yet Jesus let him remain and even gave him prominence. How could that be unless Jesus sees people far differently than I do and patiently calls the best from them? What is God like? Someone who takes common folk and turns them into saints. People common like you and I and saves us. What did Jesus do? He did good. He went around helping, healing, encouraging. He did good. And he proclaimed freedom. He has given us, because of the way he came, he has given us the chance to choose. I want to read one more short paragraph. When I look at the clues we have discussed that indicate the nature of Jesus, born in a barn, questionable parents, spotty ancestry, common name, misdirected announcement, unattractive looks, reared in a bad neighborhood, owning nothing, surrounded himself with unattractive co-workers and dying a shameful death. I find his whole approach unable to fit into the methods that automatically come to mind when I think about winning the world. His whole approach could easily be, be described as non-threatening and non-manipulative. He seemed to lead with weakness in each step of life. He had nothing in the world and everything in God and the Spirit. With this kind of approach to us, he could be sure that our response would be an honest one. None of the methods that would coerce us and get something less than genuine belief were used. This is indicative of true love. Being an others-oriented person, a servant to others, made him want to free them to be as real and honest in all things, and in him all things hold together. In other words, Jesus did nothing that would coerce people to himself. But he had a message that drew people. Back in 1974, I asked Debbie to marry me. And, uh, and she said yes, as you can imagine now. And uh, it was a very special day. 
But what if I'd pulled out a gun and said, Debbie, I want you to marry me. You're the best wife for me. Say yes. What would I think the rest of my life? You know, I'd probably have someone tasting the food before I ate it, right? <laughs> it wouldn't be love. Jesus did nothing to manipulate us. Does that make sense? It's funny how religion has evolved so that we develop a whole class of evangelists who manipulate people. Jesus did nothing of the sort. He allowed us freedom to make the most important decision in life. Jesus' teachings were different than others. When I think of baptism, we had a baptism today. Usually pastors prepare people for baptism by saying, do you believe this, believe this, believe this, and believe this, and believe this. I went through the 28 fundamental beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists. Almost all of them called for a belief. Do you believe the state of the dead? Do you believe Jesus is coming soon? Do you believe da-da-da-da? Do you know that Jesus' favorite subject was his coming kingdom? Kingdom of eternity, kingdom of God. And do you know that whenever he described who would be there, he never said the people that will be there believe such and such. Never said that once. But do you know what he did? He described their character. Blessed are the, the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who mourn over their own depravity and so on and so forth. He always described character. He said, love your enemies. Can you imagine a church full of people that, uh, that uh, loved peacemaking <laughs> and there'd be no problems in the church? Imagine that. You see, Jesus described the heart of those who are saved because he knew that his Holy Spirit living within could change people and make them into new beings. The bottom line is that Jesus wants to change your heart and change my heart and fit us for eternity. He wants to make us selfless. Heaven is selfless. Everything they did, we say, Why, why'd they do it that way? Well, to reveal what they're like. It's like the two little boys who were waiting while mom made pancakes. And they were arguing over who would get the first pancake and uh, finally, Mama, overhearing the argument, said, uh, look, Frank and John, he's, if Jesus were here, what would he do? He would say, Frank, you have the first pancake. I'll take the second one. And so Frank turned to John and he said, okay, you be Jesus. <laughs> you be Jesus. I'll have the first pancake. You see, there's something in our hearts that's very selfish and carnal. But God came to show us a better way. The Bible says that those who are saved love the what? Truth. Religion today, often when we think of religion, we think of beautiful churches, great music, eloquent preaching, and formal dress clothes. That isn't what religion is. Religion is a heart tuned into heaven. It's a a love for others and a love for God. It's a desire to be helpful and to put ourselves second. It has to do with the heart. It has to do with the character. It has to do with selflessness. And when Jesus came 2,000 years ago plus, he came to show us what God is truly like, and that's exactly what God is like. The Bible calls us to be ambassadors of heaven. We learn how to be ambassadors of heaven by seeing what Jesus was like when he was the first ambassador from heaven. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the challenge from your word. Thank you for this time of year. We know Jesus probably wasn't born on December 25, but nevertheless, it's a good opportunity to celebrate his birth, the greatest event in human history. We look forward to the second greatest event, which will be the coming of Jesus again, to take us home to live with him forever. 
I pray that each person here will have a love of the truth so as to be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing in closing.